And then I saw a rock. So if you ask today, Pastor, what happened to your nose? I face planted on one of those beautiful granite rocks. Quite frankly, I think I look pretty good. For face planting on a granite rock, we did good. I'm not sure if it's bruised yet, but you know. Hey, we made it, and I thought about it today as I was getting ready for my sermon, and we're going to talk about singles, I thought, you know what? It's been a long time since I've been single, almost 20 years, and in most of my sermons, I connect, I understand, I get it, but when I go into this one, I'm like, wow, I'm not sure I fully get it. I'm not sure I get being single anymore. So this is my disclaimer. In case this sermon becomes a face plant, and you're like, that pastor's a jerk. He has no understanding. He doesn't care. I want to assure you, I spent more time on this sermon than I have on a sermon in a really long time. And if it falls flat, and you, your heart gets hurt, Know that I care about you. And that I'm doing my very best to give you from what the Word of God says today. So, hopefully it doesn't fall flat. I don't think it's going to. But I thought I should say, I didn't connect with this sermon as well as I do in most of them. Because it's hard for me to get my brain wrapped around. So I'm hoping that you connect more than I do and understand. So, to the scriptures we go. 1 Corinthians chapter 7. We're going to read a whole bunch of verses from chapter 7. We'll read verse 1, we'll read verses 7 and 8, and then we will read 32 through 40. And so this is Paul talking to the Corinthians about their relationships, about being married and being single. So here it is, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1. Now, regarding the questions you asked in your letter, yes. It is good to live a celibate life. Get that? Mm -hmm. Okay, verse 7. But I wish everyone were single, just as I am. That's Paul. But God gives some the gift of marriage, and to others the gift of singleness. Amen. Notice the two gifts. Two gifts. Verse 32. I want you to be free from the concerns of this life. An unmarried man can spend his time doing the Lord's work and thinking about how to please him. But a married man has to think about his earthly responsibilities and how to please his wife. That's important. Yes. His interests are divided. In the same way, a woman who is no longer married or never has been married can be devoted to the Lord and holy in body and spirit. But a married woman has to think about her earthly responsibilities, and here it is, how to please her husband. Amen. Notice he says the same thing to both. Mm -hmm. This is important. I'm saying this for your benefit, not to place restrictions on you. I want you to do whatever will help you serve the Lord best, with as few distractions as possible. But if a man thinks he's treating his fiance improperly and will in inevitably give in to his passion, let him marry her as he wishes. It's not a sin. I wish there was a Greek word for duh. <laughs> but it's not there. But if he's decided firmly not to marry and there is no urgency and he can control his passion, he does well not to marry. So the person who marries his fiance does well. And the person who doesn't marry does even better. Amen. A wife is bound to her husband as long as he lives. If her husband dies, she is free to marry anyone she wishes, but only if he loves the Lord. But in my opinion, this is Paul, it would be better for her to stay single. And I think I'm giving you counsel from God's Spirit when I say this. I hope you have read that before. I hope that that's a passage of Scripture that you are able to grab a hold of and hold on to. Especially the gift and the better and the serving 
Those are all really good points that come right out of that passage of Scripture. So here's what I want you to take home. You ready? Yes. Being single and celibate in the church is better than normal. It is exceptional. Amen. Can I say that again? Being single and celibate in the church is better than normal. It is exceptional. Yes. Amen. It's exceptional. When God created each day, he called the creation good. And that's what Paul says right in the beginning of this passage. He calls being single and celibate good. Creation good. God's standard good. You picking up what we're putting down? God standard good. It's good stuff. So what's happening in Corinth? Why are they asking a question like this? It seems like a kind of an overdoing it question. Well, if you've ever done any study of the church of Corinth, the church of Corinth in a lot of ways was just barely a church in a lot of our definitions. The church in Corinth was a mess. There were people fighting. There were standards that were slipping. There was fornication. There were people who were touting themselves as better than others. And there was all kinds of mess going on. So the people in the church write a letter to Paul and say, Hey, we need some help here. We're having trouble. Paul, please, can you help us? Would you send us a letter back? And that's where we get the letter of 1 Corinthians. Is Paul is responding to a church that is struggling to figure out who Jesus is and what it means to live a righteous life. They're confused. They can't figure it out. It's really quite a mess. So they must have asked Paul, is it okay for someone to be celibate? And Paul answers their question. Very simply, Right at the beginning, just so there's no confusion, yes, it is okay. It is good. It's good for someone to be celibate. Because, well, Corinth was filled with all kinds of sexual immorality and fornication and adultery and orgies and, and, uh, and all kinds of goddess worship and all kinds of stuff that is just messed up. So in a lot of cases in Corinth, you have the one side that's really degradant, and in some circles when there's such severe sin, there is a swing the other direction. Right. And the other direction is called asceticism. They were dealing with ascetic practices. Pastor, what's, what's ascetic practices? Well, asceticism is severe self-discipline. And avoiding all types of good things. So what does that mean? Well, if you were ascetic, you would fast often. You would avoid delicious food. You wouldn't eat very much. When the church came together to eat together, you wouldn't eat very much, if not at all. Because your ascetic practices said, well, food is an indulgence. And I don't want to sin in my indulgence, so I'm going to go way over here, and just in case, I won't eat much food at all. In fact, I'll just have bread and water. Asceticism. And so the same thing was happening. Sometimes they overpray. You know you can overpray? You can, because if you are not participating in the body of Christ, there's something wrong. Because if you are a part of the body of Christ, there is a fellowship here. There is the coming together of believers. And if you abandon the gathering together of believers to pray, there's something wrong. That's not righteousness. Mm -hmm. It's asceticism. It's over doing it. Because the body of Christ, God wants to be in fellowship with us. Mm -hmm. yeah. With me, with you, right. and us. Yes. All of the above. So a set of practices would be over praying, staying away from the church and fellowship with other people. It often deems sex as evil. You probably don't know this, but in early Pentecostal circles in the 
20s and 30s and even into the 40s, they would stand up and they would testify in church. And a man or a woman would stand up and would praise the Lord that they were kept pure this week. Kept pure this week. That person was saying, I didn't have sex this week. <laughs> what? <laughs> Seriously? So it sneaks into church. It's actually not that hard to do. Because really, if you want to please the Lord, you want to do what's right. You want to do what's best. But in this case, that's what was sneaking in to the Corinthian church, was we just shouldn't have sex. I mean, all the, all the fornication, all the idolatry, all the orgies, you know what? Sex must be evil because all of this stuff is messed up. So we're not going to have sex at all. In fact, if you're engaged, you should, we're going to stay single. We're not going to allow anyone to get married because we think this is holy. So Paul is addressing what's happening in the church, and he's saying, now wait a second, wait, that's going too far. You don't have to go that far. Sex is not evil. They were abandoning marriages. They were abandoning families and relationships to be fully devoted to God. They overdid it. And they made discipline what they worshipped rather than the Lord himself. Amen. They made discipline what they worshipped rather than the Lord himself. So Paul's saying, wait, don't do it, don't. Come on, guys, come back in here. Let me help you understand what's happening. So yes, I want to tell you that it is good to be celibate. And let me, let me tell you all the rest that goes on in these relationships. What, what men and women are supposed to do for one another. How it's supposed to work. Pleasing husbands, pleasing wives. Pleasing wives, pleasing husbands. And in celibacy, it's good, even better. It's exceptional. It's exceptional. So God helps. He comes alongside. Could you be single and righteous in an oversexed culture? Now that's a question I think we can ask ourselves today. Right. Can we be celibate and righteous in an oversexed culture? It's hard. I think even back then when there wasn't media, when you couldn't get all kinds of stuff on your iPad or your phone or your TV or whatever, it was still hard today. I think it may be even harder. Can you be celibate and righteous in an oversexed culture? Being single and celibate in the church is exceptional. I want you to hang on to that. Single and celibate in the church is exceptional. In verse 7 and 8, Paul calls the singles and the widows to be single just as Paul is. Right here, Paul calls it It's really important to understand that it is a gift. And it's not a gift that we get from one another. It is a gift that we get from the Lord. It is something that God gives to us to be able to handle ourselves. Marriage and singleness are both a gift. I have heard it said in, in other sermons where someone has preached on this, I have heard it said that, you know, in, in marriage you have a spouse well, in single, God's your spouse. Can I, can I just tell you, God is God. That's right. And we want Him to be God. Amen. If yes. He has given you the gift of singleness, it's a gift so you can serve others, so that you can be a part of the church. He doesn't become your spouse. God is God. He's not male or female, just in case you didn't know. We use the pronoun he. But God is God. He's altogether different. He doesn't need to be your spouse. He needs to be the Lord. Amen. Which is more than your spouse. He needs to be the king. Which yes. is better than your spouse. God is God. So Paul makes a similar comparison. When he's comparing marriage and singleness. If you'll turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 14. He makes a very similar comparison comparison when he's talking about gifts. In this case, he's talking about spiritual gifts. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verses 1 through 4. Paul is making a comparison on good and better. 
Something's good, but this is better. So what does it say? It says, let love be your highest goal. Okay, we can stop right there, right? <laughs> Love be your highest goal. But you should also desire special abilities the Spirit gives, especially the ability for prophecy. For if you have the ability to speak in tongues, you will be talking only to God. This is a Pentecostal church. We really do pray in tongues. Mm -hmm. Amen. Come to one of our prayer services, Friday at 9.30, Sunday at 6 a.m. We pray in tongues Amen. a lot. Because it's how God edifies us in our spirit. Yes. So speaking in tongues, you will be talking only to God. Since people won't be able to understand you, you will be speaking by the power of the spirit, but it will all be mysterious. That's speaking in tongues, which is good. It's edifying our spirit. It's how God works through us, but it's mysterious. Verse 3. But one who prophesies strengthens others, encourages them, and comforts them. A person who speaks in tongues is strengthened personally, but one who speaks a word of prophecy strengthens the entire church. Amen. This is Paul. This is how he's making comparisons. So he makes the comparison about marriage. Marriage is good. It's normal. But being celibate and single is exceptional. It's better. Why? Because you have the freedom to build up the church. He makes the same reference in 1 Corinthians 14. It's good to speak in tongues. It's good to let God edify your spirit. But if you're going to say something in church, you should be prophesying so that the church can be edified. So that the church can grow. So everyone can understand. So prophesying the gift of singleness. He puts them side by side. Amen. So if you hear anything today that just as much as prophesying is a gift, singleness is a gift. It is something that we get from God. Amen. Something He takes care of in us. And it helps the church. The Apostle Paul, the great missionary, <laughs> The teacher, did you catch what it said in verse 8? That he is single himself. Mm -hmm. He's a disciple of Christ. He's an apostle to the world. And he is single. We have a number of singles in connection with our church who go out. One person in particular is single. Teaching in Africa. Yeah. I'm pretty sure. I can't even <laughs> Katie Roney watches the service in Africa the next day. But she is in Africa because, well, she's still single. And she has a gift to do that right now so she can be a blessing someplace else. A lot like the Apostle Paul. I have a friend, Heather Martin, who's a, who's a doctor. She's a medical doctor. And she has moved to Africa. She lives in Africa to treat the tribes, to go and take care of people, to administer medicine to teach and share the Word of God. I think it's a fantastic ministry to be single and be able to go do something that great. And it's great. It's not something I think I could do. A friend of mine, uh, her <coughs> husband left her when she was in her 50s. And she became someone who prayed a lot. Fellowshiped in church was there every time the doors were open but her son gave her the ability to live with him so that she could stay and pray and the Lord would speak to her and she would she would prophesy and she would encourage others she would have dreams and she would come and talk and, and her uh, well her English name is Carrie her Spanish name is Imparo if Imparo came into my office she would say John need to talk to you. It's like, oh boy, here we go. Mm -hmm. And my oh boy, here we go was usually there, the Lord has told her something and I need to listen. Amen. She spent a lot of time with Jesus. Mm -hmm. And when she spoke, I would listen. And it was usually very good. It was usually encouraging. Mm -hmm. Looking forward. Sometimes it was cautionary. 
but she was single and was able to be used by the Holy Spirit in this way that I really haven't met anyone before who has been used like that. She was a special person. A great prayer warrior. So let's go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 7 in the last 32 through 40. The spouses, the husband and the wife, have equal footing to please one another. So how do we serve? We can only serve the Lord as someone who is single. Paul says, as long as we don't burn with passion. Pretty sure that means if you need to have sex, you should get married. Pretty sure that's what he's saying. If you can't control yourself, you should probably get married. So what's the hope? So maybe there is a point where you burn with passion or your hope is to get married. What do you do in the meantime? How do you stay in the middle? How do you stay with this, this gift if there's nobody there? What are you going to do? Jesus actually said something in Matthew chapter 19, and we'll do this later on in February, a little bit more clear. But Jesus is talking to the disciples about marriage and divorce. And the disciples become incredulous because Jesus gives them a standard they don't think they can reach. Here's the hope. Jesus' disciples then said to him, If this is the case, well, then it's better not to marry. I don't know why they said that. Maybe they always wanted to divorce their wife, or maybe they did it a whole bunch of times. I'm not really sure. Maybe it was a habit they had at the time. But the, the disciples couldn't understand. How? How can you do this? And this is what Jesus said. Jesus said, Not everyone can accept this statement. Only those whom God helps. <coughs> Only those who God helps. So if you're single and you're struggling, where does our help come from? God. In all situations, it comes yeah. from the Lord. So remember, we were talking last week about the help me verse in Genesis, where the wife was supposed to be the help, the help meet, and we talked about how when that word is used in other places in the Old Testament, it usually means in battle. Mm -hmm. It usually means that God is going to come rescue them from war. Right. That your helpmate is a warrior. Thank goodness. Yes. I'm pretty sure that's what it means here, too. Amen. That your God, your help, is a warrior. Yes. And he will defend <coughs> you. He will go before you and help. Maybe even to destroy. Maybe to get you out of the warlike situation you feel that you are in. Amen. God comes to help. Only those God helps. Actually, I think that's true in a, in a lot of things, really. How, does, how do we make it as Christians? Well, we only make it by the grace of God. Yes. We only make it because God comes in and helps. He helps us. He supports us. Christ before me. Christ behind me. Yes, yes Lord Jesus, please. Yes. Help me. That help meet. God becomes your helper, your friend, and your defender. Not your spouse. Your friend and your defender. I think that might be better. So if you're single or if you're married... If you've given your life to Jesus, letting God be first is the challenge. Abandoning the sin in your life and choosing righteous living. Choosing to follow Jesus in all things. That's why I challenge so often to get into the Word. To get into Scripture. To allow the Holy Spirit to speak to you. Because, quite frankly, I do this for about 25 minutes on a Sunday morning. And you have the rest of the week to make it. You can come to a connection group almost every night of the week out here. Mm -hmm. Yes. But for yourself, how do you find out what righteous living is? How do you understand who Jesus is and how the Holy Spirit helps you unless you find it? Unless you go looking for it? God's going to help you. I promise. You start reading the scriptures and there will be stuff that jumps out at you. Now granted, some of it is in red lettering. They do that for Jesus' words. Amen. So you know. 
but other things will jump out to you. And you'll look at them. And all of a sudden in your heart, you'll be like, wow, I never knew that. I did not know that. And every now and then somebody comes in and does the, hey, pastor, did you know it says this? <laughs> I did. I do know it says that. Did you not know that? I didn't. That's phenomenal. That's challenging. Oh my goodness, what am I going to do? Don't worry. God's here to help. Yes. So you get to a spot where you're like, I can't do this. Go to the Lord. He will help you. Amen. Amen. Go to your church. We will help you. We will be here. We'll walk beside you. Yeah. That's why you can't abandon and just go pray out in the desert all your life. Yeah, man. You have to come together to be a part of the body of Christ. To be a part. So here's the question. Are you living God's way? Or are you living your way? Just kind of use God as a favor once a week for an hour on Sunday. Or are you choosing to follow Jesus in righteous living? Have you chosen Jesus today? Are you following him? Are you listening for him? Are you responding to his call? That's the challenge today. Are you living righteously? Because I think that's the challenge for everybody. And the good news is God is our help. Amen. He's our help and our salvation. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus, I don't think there is any better news that not only do you forgive us, but in our forgiveness, as you want us to walk righteously after you, you give us the help. You send your Holy Spirit to give us the ability to walk righteously with you. You give us that help. Thank you that we don't have to do it on our own. Amen. That we don't have to dig down deep and pull ourselves up by our bootstraps. Well, maybe we have to do that sometimes. But most of the time, it's you walking with us, yeah. teaching and guiding and training Church today, if you're in this place and you are struggling, you know you are not walking the way God wants you to, give it to the Lord. Everybody has their eyes closed here. I want you to keep them closed. Kind of as a group confessional. If you have something that plagues you, unrighteousness that just can't shake, Put your hand up to the Lord today. I got my hand up. Put your hand up to the Lord today. God, today we confess that we need your help. Yes. That our sin overtakes us. Whatever it is, we're still stuck in it. And we need your help. Lord, today would you heal our brokenness? Yes. Would you heal our sinfulness? Yes. Would you wash us clean? <coughs> give us the strength follow you today. And I know you're faithful. And I know you give the strength. I love you for that, Lord Jesus. Thank you for being here, Holy Spirit. Lord Jesus, we pray all of this in your name. Amen. Amen. The worship team would return to the, to the stage. I'd like to sing a hymn together, and then I'll leave us with a blessing this morning. Can we stand to sing the hymn together? Just some guy. 